in with Amanda. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone out in the interwebs. Uh, I want to start, I'll put something in the chat, but um, I want to say hi. And while I'm putting up my slides, you guys can tell me about rain in your area. Um, you definitely did get the rain. Share screen. Excellent. I'm, yep, I did too. How does that look for everyone? Yep. Okay, great. Let's move you off to the side um, so that I can see my slides. All right. So um, I'm going to talk first and then I'll hand it over to Andy. Um, I'm going to sort of set the stage for what we're talking about when we're talking about um, stormwater issues in particular, but then, you know, increased precipitation and the impact that that has on our um, best management practices for dealing with some of these issues at the residential scale. So Andy and I both work under um, programs that have to do with water. So Andy does water quality with a specific focus on well and septic. Um, and I am part of the Watershed Protection and Restoration Program. And our the goal is to support residents, local governments, nonprofits in achieving water quality uh, improvements. And increasingly, we're dealing with water quantity issues as well. And so we do this through a whole bunch of different ways, but we help build capacity in low capacity areas across the state. Uh, we provide grants assistance. Um, we do project implementations that reduce uh, nutrient and sediment loads. Of course, we all do education and outreach and we do applied research programs. So some of that will come up um, as we're moving through the presentation as well. Okay, so where do we start? Um, Maryland has a lot of turf, right? It's our largest crop in Maryland. We also have 1.5 million acres of impervious cover, and this is constantly increasing. These are anything um, that are hard surfaces, roads, driveways, rooftops. Uh, we have a lot of people. We have an increasing amount of people in our watershed. And we have a lot of dog. Um, so, you know, these sort of things come together when we're thinking about a lot of people and a lot of spaces, we need a lot of infrastructure um, to handle that. And that means more impervious cover. And then at the same time, everyone needs places to, to play and have um, access to lawn spaces. But, you know, trying to think about what that means for long-term issues such as flooding and precipitation events and how that plays into uh, how we manage our landscapes. So when I'm coming at this work, um, we're looking at the different sources and sectors that are influenced by stormwater in particular um, in terms of the water quality aspect of things, right? So we have five major sectors in the Bay. Um, this includes forest, this includes septic, this includes wastewater, this includes agriculture, and this also includes stormwater. And stormwater is the only sector that's continuing to increase in loading in the Bay. Um, with that comes, you know, it impacts to our um, rivers and streams and local water bodies. And so we're thinking about how to reduce nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. As we approach the 2025 total maximum daily load deadline, which is right around the corner, so this is the pollution diet for the Bay, um, we are going to start incorporating other aspects of water quality and water quantity, such as co-benefits, um, such as uh, habitat, such as environmental justice components, right? All of this will start to be uh, part of that reduction moving forward after the 2025 goal, which is right around the corner. Okay, so this is... See you Thursday, thank you. I'm really looking forward to your advice. 
Okay, so when we're looking at that, the audio is not important. So if you couldn't really hear it, it's not a big deal. This is a residential property in Howard County, Maryland, right? And so we're looking at this. Um, we're thinking about how much water is moving through these systems. And this is a typical one inch storm over a 24 hour period. And that's what we're designing a lot of our practices to handle, the one inch storm. I mean, maybe we get to two inches in some jurisdictions, but typically we're handling the one inch storm. And so from 1958 through 2012, there's been a 71% increase in the amount of precipitation that falls um, during heavy events. So what we're really concerned about in terms of dealing with stormwater is this first flush of pollutants that are coming off the landscape. So the first inch of pollutants, um, or the first inch of stormwater contains the most pollutants. And so the concentration is really high when you're getting these runoff events. Um, and then it starts to uh, slow down over time, right? So this is called the first flush. And some of our practices that we have today to handle um, stormwater are really meant for this first flush, this first one inch of rain. And so when we're thinking about impacts, what does that look like? You know, what does um, future climate projections, what do they look like? Um, we're going to get, as most of you know, more intense per per precipitation, yikes, it's Friday, um, uh, more intense downpours and longer periods between rain events. Uh, we're going to have intensity increases, so we're already seeing that um, in terms of storms that we've had. We're going to have more rainfall overall, and so when we have more rain and it's moving quicker through our system, we have major impacts because of stormwater, right? And, you know, we're also going to see temperatures rise, sea level rise, all of that stuff, um, but today I'm pretty much gonna focus on the precipitation piece of things. Um, so you'll see at the bottom chart there, you can look at Atlas 14 is sort of the um, NOAA data that we rely on. So it gives the, the IDF curve, which is the rainfall intensity, duration, and frequency um, that must be captured to deal with uh, management of stormwater. And so when we're thinking about that, we're gonna see Look on the far left of Annapolis, Maryland, the, um, it gives the different storm events as you go across that row there and the change in precipitation that's expected when we get to the year 2050 to 2100. Okay, just so we use, we all are using the same language, we hear about this more and more, but the 100 year storm, right? So as we're thinking about things, we're we're commonly talking about the 24 hour storm um, when we look at that one inch of rain. A hundred year storm is not a storm that happens every hundred years. It's really a storm that happens to have a 1% probability of occurring um, in a location in any year. So that doesn't mean if we get an Ellicott City kind of flooding that it can't happen the day after as well. Right, so it's just that 1% piece. Um, and so in Maryland, we're looking at 24 hour storms of a, the 100 year storm increasing to 9.47 to 9.23 inches in that, one, in that 24 hour period, right, for the 100 year storm. So it's a lot of water moving really quickly through our system. And that has major impacts, right? So my slides are blank here, um, but that's okay. I'll just talk about them. Um, the four flooding challenges that we can't yet solve are things like, huh, so weird. Oh, do you see it there? No. Yeah, we're, we're still seeing them on our oh, end. Oh, you see it. Okay, yeah. on my end, it's just totally blank, but I'm so oh, glad. Um, okay. <laughs> Great. So um, we are talking about things like we need to expand urban floodplain and boundaries. We need to look at how our property lines are labeled and drawn um, in terms of sort of what impacts that has on flood insurance. We need to look at failing infrastructure 
This is something that's happening everywhere, right? Um, and then we look at, you know, higher storm surge, uh, sea level rise, those types of things as well. So we have a lot of challenges that are happening with our flooding um, situation. Okay, and then what's at risk in our communities, right? So this public infrastructure, these uh, networks of pipes, and we have roads and then bridges and you know all of these infrastructure type pieces that are public. And then on the privacy side of things, we have um, increasingly more residential flood damage. And so we're looking at uh, how to prevent sort of these flashier storms from moving through our system. So um, major infrastructure issues. This is another uh, a photo of Ellicott City. A similar storm happened in the Maiden's Choice watershed in Baltimore City, um, and it wasn't as widely um, reported on, but we're seeing these you know, happen in more and more spaces across the, our state. All right. so. What can we do? Um, we basically can tell ourselves jokes uh, because it's sort of a, a sad story that we're dealing with right now, right? And we have to laugh um, so that we don't cry moving forward. So I threw in a little couple garden jokes. Feel free to steal these and use them anytime you would like to. Um, but seriously, what can we do? Well, so we can't solve all flooding issues with the practices that I'm about to talk about. They're really designed for that, you know, first flush of pollutants coming off the landscape. Rain barrels and cisterns are one of those best management practices. They don't deal with flooding, right? And so on a thousand square foot home, you have about 600 gallons of runoff in a one inch rainstorm. That is a lot of water to try and deal with in rain barrels. Um, and so it's one tool to helping people achieve water quality goals. And it doesn't really address this practice in particular water quantity issues, right? Um, and so we're looking at things like larger cisterns moving forward in the future and what does that look like? The exciting thing is that stormwater is still a very, um, developing and emerging science. So there's so much room for um, learning new things and implementing new things. And so we're sort of at a moment in time where we really are, are trying to figure out what are the next best management practices that can deal with that quantity issue um, that we're going to face, especially moving forward in Maryland. Um, rain gardens, all of you have heard of and probably put in rain gardens, but another uh, best management practice that really is designed for that one to two inch storm over a 24 hour period to collect those pollutants running off the landscape, right? So we're reducing nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment here. Um, there are other co-benefits as well, such as habitat creation, you know, biodiversity, um, those types of things, which are all great for environmental uh, wellness and protection. But it doesn't, these don't necessarily deal with a quantity issue. And that is because that the more heavily engineered a site is with best management practices, um, the higher the cost. And so we haven't seen local jurisdictions uh, designing beyond the two inch. 24 hour rainstorm because of the extra cost of putting in these practices. And so that's sort of where we're going in this is we need to figure out what sort of capacity we're gonna have to deal with in some of these practices so that we can deal with more uh, flooding on site. Um, okay, so things like permeable pavement, uh, porous concrete, porous asphalt, right? Those are all great options. 
it depends on the space and the financial resources you have to putting these in, but another good practice for dealing with what falls on the site stays on the site in this case. Um, and so you want to make sure that you have, you know, the right uh, choice for the, the right practice for the right space. Um, and that pertains to both uh, the residential design um, that we're doing and also larger applications such as parking lots uh, or um, roads. We always want to do sustainable lawn care. Since we have so much turf in Maryland, we want to make sure we're taking care of it and not contributing to extra runoff. Um, so just making sure you're mowing at a high height. My neighbor over here, uh, he likes to mow his like uh, to a millimeter uh, size. And, um, and it's like a golf course. And so, you know, it's never a great idea to try and do behavior change campaigns on your neighbors or your family members. Uh, okay, and then trees are great, right? And we have a 5 million tree goal in Maryland. Um, we're always planting trees. If you want trees, let me know. Uh, we, are, we are regularly giving away trees and they do a lot of function for soaking up stormwater, for slowing down flooding. And that's what we want, the slow down um, soak in effect to happen. And so they can help, uh, right tree, right place, they can help with these uh, larger precipitation events that are happening. Um, but today I'm really gonna focus on conservation landscaping. And conservation landscaping is a, a practice. It's also a, a theory. So if you are familiar with the conservation, uh, Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, they came up with the eight essential elements. And these include things like um, benefits to the environment as a whole, aesthetic well-being, um, using locally native plants, providing habitat for wildlife, promotion of clean air, water, um, healthy soil, and a reduction in the amount of energy, waste, um, those types of things. So, but I'm gonna talk about the practice of conservation landscaping or the best management practice. So what is conservation landscape and where should it be applied? I can't see, oh, I can pull up the chat, okay. Where do you think this conservation landscape or a conservation landscape should be installed? Location one, location two, or location three? Everyone's welcome to use the chat to put oh, their answer. Okay, down. thank you, Alan Hicks. All right, number three, good start. Okay, location three, all right. Okay, all three, Patricia. Yeah, everyone. Okay, great. So um, this is sort of a trick question because yes, all three are excellent locations for conservation landscape. They are capable of handling some of the more intensity of our storms, um, as opposed to some of the other practices that really do a lot of that infiltration, groundwater recharge, um, system of processes uh, that happen in these systems. So a conservation landscape is really uh, capable of being applied in any situation, right? So location one is great because it's before it enters the stream, right? And runs off the hillside and enters the stream. So that really is before you want to place a practice between a runoff source and a runoff destination. Perfect. Um, lo location good too is good um, because, you know, it doesn't have necessarily a drainage area, but it will reduce runoff from going down both sides of the hill. Um, so that's also a great option. And then location three is where we're most often seeing these practices placed. Um, and that is, you know, a directed downspout being placed into the practice. 
or a treatment train being set up where you have a rain barrel or a cistern, and then that overflows into a conservation landscape, right? So it's a really flexible um, best management practice. And so it depends on your design objectives um, and it depends on sort of what types of storms and frequency you're ha handling, um, but it can be applied in almost any scenario. So this is a um, section of looking at a conservation landscape. So it's really not, it's similar in terms of its uh, section drawing to a rain garden, but you'll see that the soil media depth is only six to 12 inches as opposed to that 24 inches plus. Um, and you know what we're really trying to get out of the practice is that you want it to be a little bit concave um, you want water to go in, but you don't want water to sit in there for a long time like you would a rain garden and infiltrate in. Um, so, you know, this is, it can handle a little bit of infiltration, but it's not designed with a big ponding area like you would have in a rain garden um, that where water is meant to sit and then slowly soak in. So this is a great um a great practice for really any area, especially if you want to take up some turf or some impervious cover and turn it into sort of more of a amended soil and native plants garden. So you can calculate runoff um, based on your, so that you understand what's, how big your practice should be. Um, this slide walks you through that, so we're not going to spend a whole bunch of time calculating runoff today. And the next couple slides also talk about um, reduction calculations. But it's just to say that you can re reference this in the future if you want to know how large of a conservation landscape you want to um, capture. So the important thing to know on this slide is that, you know, the first, this is designing for a one inch storm you'll see the one inch over 12 inches, right? And gets you into feet. Um, and then you see the concrete patio. So you, you know, take a section of a roof or a concrete patio that's draining into your practice. Um, you calculate the uh, square footage of that. And then this 90% of rain becomes runoff. It's this 0.9, it's a runoff coefficient. It's essentially these engineering numbers that says, on any landscape, 90%, if it's hard surface, completely impervious, 90% is running off. And that's to say some escapes through evapotranspiration and other system processes, Not maybe not all 100% are running off the property, but pretty close, right? 90%, 95% maybe sometimes. Um, if you get something like compacted turf, you might be more at like 0.5 of a coefficient, right? Um, so that's the only difference uh, in the calculation that you'll make is understanding which uh, which type of surface the drainage area is running into your practice, right? So is it hard surface? Is it turf? Is it some other um, uh, type of surface that's running into there? So um, you can use this to calculate runoff. You can also use, I put a link in here when you get the slides, um, this sizing conservation landscapes. There is a, um, a manual that's super useful created by the Watershed Stewards Academy in Anne Arundel County. And it walks you through each of the different best management practices that exist and uh, tells you not only how to install them step-by-step, step, but also walks you through the sizing of these practices. It's a, the resources are all linked also at the end, so you'll have that. So Conservation Landscape is an approved, a Bay Program approved uh, practice for um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment reduction. So that means, that local governments who have to meet permit requirements or their meet their total maximum daily loads can take this information and these small scale practices, crunch the numbers, quantify them, and then report that for helping to meet their permit goals. If they don't have a permit, these are voluntary practices overall, these small scale practices. 
Um, and so it's just sort of extra bonus um, for the communities in which these practices are going in, right? So overall conservation landscapes were given just a lump sum removal rate per practice uh, to calculate how much you are actually reducing per practice, you can walk through uh, these calculations, right? So you, all you would do, these are examples, all you would do is put in your numbers uh, and then you can walk through the equations to figure out how much of the re reduction you're having in your practice, right? Okay, well, for a quarter acre, um, we're having, you know, it's a pretty small impact. You're reducing 1.8 pounds of nitrogen, right? And the numbers are small, but if you think about that, about being aggregated on the landscape, everything adds up, right? And so we get closer to meeting those um, water quality goals by having people implement these practices. Okay, so I'm sure that most people here already um, know and talk about native plants a lot, but just so we're all on the same page because Andy and I are gonna give plant recommendations, just three quick slides on native plants. Um, why do we use them? Well, biodiversity, um, they occur within our natural habitats. Um, they have co-evolved evolutionarily to um, with all the plants and animals around them. And so there are, you know, benefits beyond that, as you can see on the slide, but even beyond that, um, the benefits of native plants are what we're using in our landscapes. And so what is a cultivar? And are we, um, are we against cultivars? This is a discussion we always have, right? What is a cultivar? Well, it's that genetically modified um, piece. And so, you know, the, we have some um, people we work with who are straight species fanatics, you know, and they don't believe in anything with cultivars uh, where we're making any modifications for things like flower color, height preference, um, you know, compactness in spaces, branching patterns, right? Glow in the dark, which is there, hard to see. Um, so these kinds of, considerations. I am not by any means a native species um, only sort of designer. I believe in sort of using the right plants in the right spaces. And that would mean things like using this um, cultivar of Bruce um, Aromatica, this grow low fragrant sumac um, that is really nice in the landscape can fit in a lot of spaces, right? So other examples I'm sure you're well aware of and why do we like them and why do we want them installed? Well, there's, there's a lot of reasons why this could be the case. A lot of it comes down to space and preference for aesthetics um, in these cases, but this is a really hot research topic. So I'm really excited when we get the native plant specialist um, that some of that work will be um, dug into a little bit further. All right, so design tips overall for these spaces. Plan for maintenance. It's the number one thing um, I can tell people to do. So we are the first state in the country to have low impact development best management practices that are similar to bioretention in rain gardens. So um, Larry Kaufman designed them. We were really ahead of the curve. The Pacific Northwest has now bypassed us, but uh, the early day practices were seen as really a failure because aesthetically they were not maintained, right? So functionality wise, they were doing pretty well in the landscape but aesthetically people were not happy with how they looked um, um, in this space. So plan for long-term maintenance. We're seeing grantors just now focus on how to uh, support that and it's still not adequate amount. Um, many of you are probably familiar with Claudia West. Claudia West is a landscape architect. Um, she works with Fido in DC. And uh, she wrote a book on green mulching. 
And so we're using this idea of green mulching as opposed to the two inch layer of mulch that we're putting on, uh, used to putting on our landscapes in, the, in, in these practices. So we want the ground covered. We want sort of this um, layered approach to plants. So we want sort of the micro scale, understory, um, middle herbaceous layer, canopy layer, right? So that is a very new uh, part of how we've been selling some of these best management practices is by uh, covering the ground and filling the space so that the invasives don't have the opportunity to move in. There's less long-term mulch input requirements um, and you know they do a better job sort of uh, working together in the space. So planting in masses so that legibility and maintenance are easier. Typically we wanna plant in uh, odd numbers, right? So um, grouping them together in odd numbers is a design approach. And then planting in matrix. Um, and this is because it emulates nature. Again, the maintenance person needs to know what the plants are uh, when they're going in so that they can actually read the garden. Shopping smart. A lot of the nurseries know that natives are uh, becoming more and more of a desired, consumer desired um, product, but people have to ask for them, right? So there's still not enough uh, momentum around native plants so that people haven't shifted over really to creating um, native plants in a large way, right? We still have small nurseries that support native plants or native only at their spaces, um, but the larger wholesale places may not do just natives, right, at this point. Um, and that is, you know, consumer driven. Um, make sure you know where the plants are sourced from, all those kinds of things. Um, so try them in unusual places. And just an example of how you could use uh, natives in three different ways here. And then of course, always be mindful of deer in these uh, spaces. Luke has done some great work on um, deer and wildlife management in these spaces. Okay, and then let's get into the favorites, right? So how are we um, dealing with this? Well, we're thinking about um, plants that can sustain uh, their roots in water in these different practices for longer periods of time. But this is an area that needs a lot of research, right? So we are still sort of learning as we go about what works and does what doesn't work. And I would be thrilled to hear about examples that you have um, that you've seen in your landscapes that are doing really well in these um, sort of more flood prone areas. So we have um, favorite trees and you'll you'll get all these slides so it'll it'll exist. Um, and we when we teach classes on selecting tree species, we always try and look at reference landscapes. So depending on what physiographic province you're in, what historical sort of tree um, assemblages are there. So I live in a oak hickory um, area. And so we're always trying to plant, refer you know, use that as a historical um, indication of what plants would maybe work best in our backyard. Shrubs, same idea. Um, remember, we want that, you know, sort of green mulch idea. And so layering these pieces together in a conservation works really well. And then this, um, and then the favorite perennial section. And if, if um, some of you are probably familiar with Robin Wall Kimmerer's uh, Braiding Sweetgrass book, and she talks a lot about this combination of the purple asters and the solidago. And um, and she says, you know, when she was in graduate school, she was asking, wanted to ask, like, why are these two things so successfully beautiful together, right? And so um, it's this idea around 
traditional ecological knowledge and how to integrate that into research and science. And it's a very wonderful, beautiful book. So um, if you haven't read it, it's a great one. So common native perennials that are working in the environment that we can also purchase. Like that's an important piece of this is that we can make recommendations for really great, wonderful plants, um, but then people can't buy them. Uh, so these are, these are all from my yard um, over the years. And I was just out this morning in the rain taking some more pictures of them. So, all right. And then um, we have the same for the favorite ferns in these areas and the favorite grasses in these areas, right? So we have all these curated plant lists that exist. Um, there are many more available. And at the end, I put in the resource of the native plant guide, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but you can search based on condition, right? So. Um, wet areas in particular you can search for. There's a lot of resources for templates that already exist for conservation landscapes. Um, this one is from the Montgomery County Rainscapes Program where they have a beautiful guide on um, each of the practices that I talked about today, but um, specifically highlighting the conservation landscape piece uh, that's here in, these, in, the, in the resource here. So thinking about the different plants that go together in these spaces, it can be really overwhelming for people who aren't designers or people you're working with in the communities to not feel overwhelmed by plant choice, right? And so having a reference of what works well together um, can be very helpful. So iris in particular, um, the blue fag iris that can go at the bottom of a practice that has really high nutrient reduction rates, especially for nitrogen. So we always recommend that in these practices where they're receiving water because they can have that um, wet feet in these spaces. Okay, and then just a little before, a couple before and after. So um, these might be a selling point for someone who's thinking about a practice or uh, looking at how to do some turf reduction in their own property. So very simple, they didn't remove all their turf, but they removed a small section at the front and put a combination of these uh, plants there that look quite lovely. I think it adds, adds curb appeal. Other examples of conservation landscapes, um, the one on the right with the little kid walking on it. Um, that one is at like a large commercial space. So applied in that um, larger scale. The one on the left is in a townhome community in Annapolis. And um, it's a small little section of conservation landscape but behind each of the residents' houses. Okay, we have the same sort of, um, these are also in Annapolis as conservation landscapes in an alleyway behind um, a residential space. So each homeowner has responsibility for taking care of these small sections of conservation landscape. This is at Brookside Gardens in Montgomery County, um, combination of that sort of approach to ground cover, middle herbaceous layer, canopy layer, um, all in that space. And so if you're thinking about that, you want to think about uh, adaptive management over time. So how will that change when the tree grows up and shades out everything underneath and what kind of plan does that need? This is a, the left is a residential property in Baltimore that had a newly installed conservation landscape. Uh, the right is Constitution Gardens in the city of Gaithersburg, which is a native plant community, um, uh, sorry, uh, a pocket park, and it's a native plant um, garden and also nature play space. So I have a take your turn in here. So if you want to design a conservation landscape, this walks you through it. Um, this is an idea for how to practice 
putting this together or how to share this information with the clients that you're working with to have them sort of walk through the process and have a hands-on um, approach to doing it. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Andy and then we'll come back at the end to look at resources. Amanda, just one okay. quick question that we had um, in the chat while we're transitioning. Someone had asked if your plant lists are good for flood prone, sorry, specifically flood prone yeah. areas or just the Piedmont area in general. So these ones that I presented are more Piedmont area. Um, we do have a specific flood list, um, flood plant list that I will uh, ref give in the references. And then uh, also um, Andy will talk about plant it, more plants in his section um, that address some of those things as well. Good awesome, question. thank you. Yeah. Sure. Okay, well, hello everybody. I'm Andy Lazur. I'm a statewide water quality specialist and I deal primarily with private wells, drinking water quality and septic systems. And probably the most popular question I get about septic systems is how can we landscape? So we're going to talk about that. And it's interesting how there's a lot of similarities to what Amanda presented and even a lot of the same species, but we do have some special uh, considerations for septic systems when we're talking about landscaping. And so that's what I'm going to share. So let me just quickly share my screen and hopefully you can see that. So, um, yep, looks good. Yeah, so I'm going to, you know, again, in this uh, brief discussion, uh, I'm going to talk about some system types. So in order for us to landscape a septic system, we have to understand what a septic system is and some of the special uh, considerations re regarding that, and then to come up with some specific strategies and then practices. You know, um, Amanda mentioned, you know, you've got a plan for maintenance, right? Well, anytime you plant anything, as you all know, you still have to maintain it. And, and that would be true even with when we get into landscaping septic systems. But so I'm going to walk through a couple of things. And one of the one of the things I really want to um, mention to you is that, you know, when we particularly newer homes um, <clears throat> in the last, say, 20 years, uh, there are basically set aside areas or repair areas. So uh, MDE who regulates septic systems in Maryland requires, you know, that there's in addition to the original drain field that there are repair areas, you know, up to 10,000 square feet. So three, three systems, the original and then two repairs. This is just showing one repair. But I mentioned this because it's so important that when you're trying to landscape your, your whole um, property that you keep in mind that these repair areas are need special attention. So what happens with the original drain field? And the drain field is designed to ultimately, uh, it's going to get clogged up. So it's drain, it, it's designed to take the organic material and, and infiltrate into the soil, but eventually that will clog up. And so the lifespan may be 25, 40 years. I've seen them last longer, much longer, and I've seen them fail shorter than that, uh, even with 10, 10 years if they're not properly maintained. So you can you have to maintain these areas and you can plant your repair areas, but you, you can't put trees on them and things like that. So just, just a little uh, kind of a warning that you have to plan your whole landscape and, and plan for repairs and landscape, you can landscape the repair area. So um, a conventional system, and this is important to note because this is where we really get into issues with certain types of plants, particularly trees. Uh, oftentimes the rule of thumb is don't plant any trees absolutely even near your, your, your system, but there's some exceptions to that and we'll talk about that. But this is a conventional system, which just means it has a septic tank, a distribution box, and several gravel trenches, okay? And these gravel trenches can be anywhere from two to 10 feet deep, just dependent upon the location and the soil conditions and such. So, the, so it's designed for that wastewater to infiltrate into the soil and then get the filtration and purification that we're looking for. 
And so the, this particular example has some turf on that, and turf is fine. That's not very um, interesting. Um, so we'll talk about certain types of plants, but the, you can use certain types of shallow rooted plants that will help actually to take up both the nutrients and some of the moisture. And that's particularly important as we um, recall what Amanda was saying about, you know, more rainfall. And so to have plants taking up moisture around your drain field and your, your septic system is actually a great thing to do. But there's a lot of different types of drain fields. So a real important message here is every septic system is unique in that it's designed for that size home, the number of people in bedrooms, but also the soil conditions, the soil quality. So if you have real tight soil, uh, the water doesn't infiltrate as fast. That means you're going to have to have a lot bigger drain field. And if you have a high water table, then you may have to go up, like in the case of this um, sand mound here uh, in the middle on the bottom. Whoops, sorry. And so this is, you know, a situation where you have to really know what type of drain field in particular you have. Because a septic tank is watertight. And so, you know, even shallow roots shouldn't be able to get inside the tank unless it's worn out or whatever, but it's the drain field that we're really concerned about as far as the types of plants that we use. So you have different types, conventional trench here in the upper left, and then the sand mound I mentioned, and then up on the upper right, we have this drip tube, and, and, and I'll, I'll show you a graphic that shows that, that that's actually very shallow in the six six to eight to 10 inch uh, soil depth. So again, you have to know where your drain field is and what type before you can begin any sort of landscape practices because these different types will require different landscape strategies. So this is a mound system and it's basically uh, using a an advanced treatment unit or as we call in, in Maryland here, best available type technology, BAT. I'll show you one in just a minute. And then the water is pumped up and elevated to this in the mound, because typically if we have a very high water table or very shallow quality soil, we need to build up. And uh, these are a lot more expensive, but you can landscape uh, even a sand mound. And I have a picture of one uh, coming up. And then here's the drip system. This is typically, again, using a BAT, and then it's pumped up into that top 6 to 12 inches, 6 to 10 inches of soil, and that's the most bioactive portion of the soil, as you know, as master gardeners. And so we're getting a lot of really good uh, quality treatment uh, with a drip system. And the drip tubing is not easy for roots to penetrate, okay? So you can actually use drip around trees, and they often do that in, in yards where there's not much open space and they have trees. So uh, there is new, newer technology. Drip's probably been around 15 years or so, but um, it, it is offers, you know, really good quality treatment, high, you know, uh, filtration rates and things, but also offers you the ability to... Uh, um, excuse me, distribute your wastewater in a drain field situation among trees. So here's a BAT unit. It's basically, again, a, like a miniature wastewater treatment plant in your backyard, if you will. Um, and there are different designs. We have three different uh, manufacturers here that are approved in Maryland, and they do a great job in uh, treating the wastewater. And here's just a schematic of one real quickly. And the reason I wanted to show you this is that that uh, not only uh, do they do great treatment, as you can see here, they remove 55 to 77% of the nitrogen compared to a septic tank, which only removes about 6%. Uh, but what you see here in this particular example is uh, there's multiple chambers that provides the aeration for the beneficial bacteria to do what they need to do. But this particular one has three access risers, okay? And so, that may be a feature that you need to kind of quote landscape around. Um, but again, so this is a different type of system. And real quickly, what I wanted to point out here with this graphic is just to show you that we're relying on mother nature 
uh, in a lot of ways to treat our wastewater, our home wastewater, not only uh, the, the beneficial bacteria that's already in the wastewater, but certainly the beneficial bacteria and organisms in the soil. Uh, and they do a great job of handling uh, nitrogen, et cetera, uh, taking care of some of the other uh, nutrients, a lot of the organics. But um, what you'll see here is that a drain field requires oxygen, oxygen for those beneficial bacteria to convert the nitrogen, uh, but also that bacteria helps to, um, again, break down the organic matter that we want. And so we're trying to get and take advantage of all that beneficial bacteria and other organisms to, to maximize the treatment of our wastewater before it uh, leaches down into groundwater. So oxygen is needed. And, and I like to say that drain fields need to breathe. And so when we're landscaping a drain field, we don't wanna use any hard cover. We don't wanna use mulch. So the uh, concept that Amanda was sharing about green mulching is ideal. Um, Cause typically what we would do with landscaping a drain field is we would we would uh, increase the density of planting because we don't want mulch uh, on it because that mulch can, can uh, particularly like some of the oak mulches, can actually become hard and it's shedding water and it's not it's not getting the oxygen that we want for treatment. So here's a BAT. These are some of the features that people uh, send me pictures of and say, "How can I? You know, what can I do with this to try to landscape it?" And and really, landscaping is, there's all sorts of ways to approach this. And so here's some of the challenges that we see. We see the three access risers. And then this particular one has the electric supply with a post. And that's not very sightly pleasing. And here's another, another uh, elevated BAT unit. This actually has four chambers. Here's that picture of the sand mound again. And then in some cases, we have these drain field inspection ports. Okay, And that's, that's a maintenance type of situation situation, particularly with some of the newer technology. Uh, they may periodically check those to be sure that water's not uh, ponding. So again, you have to build around and, and design around some of the, the uh, infrastructure, and it can be done. So here's some examples. Um, and you can see here the three risers here uh, in the background. And again, this was not, you know, re fairly recently planted. The, the one issue I might suggest is is uh, find out what tree species that is. That might be a problem. Um, and then here's a very simple example where they've, you know, covered uh, the access ports uh, with a little bit of landscaping, you know, again. And here's an access port that's covered with a bird bath, uh, and, you know, and some nice pollinator plants and some different textures and things like that. So again, it's, you know, again, whatever is up to your creativity, it's just a question of the types of plants uh, that you really need to think about. So this is a sand mound that was planted with a, a, a variety of, of species and uh, really very aesthetically pleasing. And this is very important because in some lots, the only place that uh, was suitable soil may be the front yard. And certainly people don't want a bare, you know, mound two or three feet high out in their front yard uh, or even their backyard. So this, this is an opportunity to use different uh, shallow rooted plants, grasses, pollinators, et cetera, create some habitat and certainly some really good uh, both curb appeal and just a aesthetic value. And here's another mound that was um, was landscaped. Uh, this is one I have a little bit of concern with possibly uh, because of the gravel, depending upon how deep that is. We don't want, again, we don't want to block the oxygen flow. And then here's uh, another example um, where a mound system was was landscaped and a couple of things here to point out that might be of concern is, all right, what are those, what tree species is that? Is that, what type of drain field do they have? Could that be a problem? Because tree roots and particularly a conventional system, which is that um, corrugated pipe and the gravel, tree roots can easily get into there and, and, and completely clog the pipe. And therefore you would end up probably having uh, either surfacing of wastewater in, in before the clog or even backing up in the house. And then the, this mulch issue, again, is, is an issue. This is a drain field that was um, said, it's off the offline, but it was um, 
landscaped over a drain field. And I, I would be concerned with the mulch. And then here's another situation where a mound actually, where they actually cut into the mound, one edge of the mound and put a wall with landscaping. So that's a big no-no, obviously, for obvious reasons. You don't want to infringe on uh, a mound system. So again, you know, there's do's and don'ts uh, with any of this landscaping, but it's it's the common sense, the reason behind that. We want our drain fields to breathe. We don't want to compact it. We don't want to um, put anything, you know, hard structure over it uh, to block that airflow. And then there's several publications. I think this in, in my resource uh, slide at the end. Uh, this is one from Minnesota Extension where they have different design plans. And uh, again, there's, uh, they're not, you know, they're kind of unlimited, you know, as far as being creativity, but also just thinking about certain things, certain requirements, which I'll walk through in just a minute or two. And again, we always have to be aware that we want to build in our repair areas into our total landscape plan and, you know, be very uh, attentive to those repair areas. And again, here's a, an example, same publication, looking at different places to potentially put mounds. Now, uh, again, uh, soils can vary greatly on, um, you know, lots. And so you have to have suitable soil. And so, again, that would be determined by the designer, the septic designer, possibly the county to go out there and to, you know, con conduct some some trenches to look at the soil structure, texture, et cetera, and, and do PERT tests. So again, it's not that you just place a mound anywhere. It has to, it's all dictated by that soil quality. And then also the lay of the land. You know, there's certain places that you don't want to put your drain field. And that tends to be in the lower areas um, where you would have collection of fine sediments and, and it would block the, uh, the water infiltration or percolation. So some basic tips here. Okay, again, you have to know the drain field because your landscaping strategies will vary depending upon that drain field system, okay? And then when you have identified that and you've laid it out and you've identified what plants you're gonna do, you don't wanna dig real deep to, you know, to till it up. And um, particularly if it's a drip system, because it's only six, let's say 10 inches deep. Now, if you have deep trenches, you could go deeper and then that would be fun. Again, so it goes back to knowing the type of drain field. So the question then is, how do you know what type of drain field you have? Well, uh, the first thing I can recommend to you, if it's a relatively new home, say in the last 30 years, the county environmental health office or health department and in a few counties it might be the the uh, either the public works or our department of environmental protection uh, they would likely have records when the, because they issue the septic permit that they would have records of that system and, and maybe even a diagram of where the the tank is where the drain field is but it would tell you you know the type of drain field system that you have, and uh, also its depth and things like that. And so that's really important information to know. So if the county doesn't have that, and you don't have, um, say, access ports to even identify where your, your, your tank is, then you probably should have that system inspected, and they can identify uh, where your system is, as well as what type of system that you have. And then another thing, and again, we're, you know, Amanda was talking about rainfall. Rainfall, we don't want standing water over our uh, drain field. And that's because a drain field is handle, uh, designed to handle a certain amount of water per day. Okay, typical, say, four bedroom home is designed to handle 600 gallons a day. Well, if we get, if you're using, say, most of that by washing and showering, and, you know, flushing the toilet, you know, et cetera. Uh, and then you get a heavy rain. And if that rainwater sits on top of that drain field for any length of time, you know, longer than a day or so, then it, what's happening is it's overloading that, that drain field or that soil's ability to take that. 
and you don't want that. So you want to slope your any sort of drainage away from your, your tank and your drain field. And you can do that different ways, whether it be a French drain around the drain field, you know, berms, slopes, whatever the case may be. And then if you have a new system, it's good to be able to plant something on there quickly so that you don't have an erosion. That's particularly true if you have a mound. If your drain field is flatter, it may not be as quite an issue, but you'd want to plant it um, as soon as you possibly can. That's in case if you have a, uh, a new system. And then think about it, your, your system is gonna need to be serviced, whether it's a BAT and they'll come by once or twice a year, uh, or you are pumping your tank, say every two to five years. You wanna be able to allow them room to get to those access ports. Okay, so think about that in your landscape plan. You, not, you, know, you don't necessarily need to have a path, but something to where they can be able to get in, get the hose in there, uh, pull up the lids and, and you know, easily access and service the system. And then and here's a big rule of thumb. Do not drive over the drain field, okay? Now, if you have a landscaper come in and do things, you can see the little um, compact track loader uh, photo. We, that is the type of device uh, machinery that you want. You do not want any tires or a backhoe to come in there and, and uh, you know, dig dig holes or scratch the surface or whatever the case may be, because tires uh, compact the soil. And when you compact the soil, you're reducing its ability to take water. And so you're harming your drain field if you do that. But these compact loaders are fine. And certainly if you're mowing over your drain field, that's, a, that's, that's okay too. Just don't mow over, a, you know, a wet drain field. Let it dry out a day or two. And then again, I already mentioned these trees. And so you can you can use trees and you know, like drip dispersal goes right around the trees, and that that's fine, but certainly not a conventional system. Uh, even even a deep trench conventional system where you have the gravel and then that perforated pipe. Um, tree roots are amazing. You know, what are they like? We all know this, right? Water and nutrients. And what do we have with a septic system? Plenty of that. So you want to avoid that. Uh, again, there's some exceptions that I'll talk about. And I've worked with, you know, probably many homeowners and, and I'm, I love trees. Um, but again, certain trees near a system uh, just are, you know, asking for, you know, a clog to happen. But what I've have suggested and, and I believe has worked in some cases is for folks to, if they have a favorite tree and it's kind of maybe a little too close to the drain field is consider putting in a root barrier. Uh, and again, you have to understand when we talk about landscaping systems, there's not a lot of science, you know, there hasn't been research, you know, replicated research on this. It's more of observation over time with different people working on systems and finding problems and, and seeing systems or certain types of plants that don't seem to be interfering, maybe even be helping it. So it's it's kind of in, in some ways anecdotal, but it's it's good observation material. But again, the root bearers may be an option. And again, we're gonna talk about, you know, lower maintenance native piece, uh, plants that, you know, with a, you know, more shallow or non-invasive types of roots. So here's a, you know, a, a, just a kind of a generic list of plants. You can see there's a lot of choices and some of these are the same ones that uh, Amanda showed earlier. Okay, so grasses do well, very well. And the nice thing about even turf is that you're, you, you get a, you know, a relatively shallow root system and, and you're, you're continually mowing it. So it's taking up water and you cut it and it keeps growing and growing. Other grasses do the same thing. In fact, other grasses may be more beneficial because they have deeper roots uh, compared to, say, fescue. Um, so again, you, there's a longer list than this. Uh, I have another slide or two. You know, there's some sedges, there's ground covers, uh, you know, and even, you know, wildflower meadow mixes, although you have to kind of look at each species on the meadow mixes to be sure that they're not, uh, well, first off, that they're native, but also that they're not uh, overly uh, aggressive roots. Okay, so again, a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity for aesthetics and habitat creation, just as what uh, Amanda was saying. So again, certain practices 
very similar to what Amanda said, but again, some uh, you know specific things, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is actually a, a list from DNR. This is their, you know, suggested for dry meadows. And a lot of these are very appropriate. In fact, I think all of these would work well. Um, again, uh, for drier conditions, uh, and that might be something like uh, dependent upon the slope of the, of the uh, area, the land around your, your drain field. And then they even have uh, suggested plants here for a wetter system. So if you happen to have um, you know, an area where your drain field is, it's maybe it tends to be a little bit on the wetter side. That's these, a lot of these would work, the ferns, et cetera. So again, a lot of options, a lot of things you can do to create some habitat. And, you know, again, what happens with these plants is that they're a little deeper rooted than, than turf grass and they'll pick up more moisture and nutrients and, and, and can help this, help the system. Now, when we talk about trees, uh, again, these are some of the do's and don'ts. And and again, not a lot of science here, just observation, you know, with a lot of people, uh, educators, regulators, and certainly um, septic professionals over the time have run into problems, uh, particularly these, you know, the beaches, the maples, willows, you know, and oaks. I had an oak uh, when I lived down in Florida that uh, the roots followed the 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 um, drip line of the roof around a corner and, and towards the side of the house, almost to the back of the house. Just amazing that they were able to, you know, grow over time. I was putting actually putting in a drain system and I had to cut through all these roots and such. So anyway, they're they can be very aggressive and you certainly wouldn't want that around a conventional drain field. And then some of the other species uh, tend to be less aggressive as far as their roots, uh, some of the cherries, dogwoods, things like that. So, uh, but typically the rule of thumb is even with those, you want them 25 feet away from the drain field. Uh, people have asked, well, what about oaks uh, or, you know, maple? Um, and again, we don't have an, ex there's not an exact science says that you have to be 53 feet away, but uh, 50 feet has come up that you keep them as far away as possible. The exception to that would be, say, if you have a, a more advanced system using drip uh, dispersal. Uh, so again, you'll see other publications that say absolutely no trees near your system. Well, that is true if you have a Con conventional gravel trench system because of the clogging that has occurred over time. So some other tips to consider. Again, we talked a little bit about this. Now, turf is, is fine. Now, again, it, it helps incre increase that water loss from the system. I already mentioned about don't mow when your soil is wet because you're um, even, you're, you're, well, a push behind mower, your foot actually adds a lot more compaction than say a, a riding lawnmower, but you still don't want to do it when it's wet. Okay. Um, and again, I already talked about this, none of the hard structure, fabrics, whatever the case may be. I really like this idea of the green mulch. That is, that is perfect. Uh, and again, we want that soil to breathe. And uh, this has come up, this question I get a lot uh, about a vegetable garden. And um, for obvious reasons, particularly if it's a shallow system, um, you know, there are risks. Think about what's in wastewater. I mean, with wastewater, not only do you have pathogenic bacteria, but you have, yeah, you have the nutrients, but you also have a lot of personal care products that uh, the system is, you know, um, loaded with daily that we use, you know, whatever that may be, you know, soaps, cosmetics, you know, um, in, in, you know, pharmaceuticals, you know, whatever the case may be going into your system. And you don't want your plants picking these things up. Uh, so we generally suggest keeping the vegetable garden away from the drain field. Um, and again, even with a deep, deep system, there might be some risk associated with that. So uh, the rule of thumb is, you know, just don't have a vegetable garden, non-edible plants. And then even when you're working over it, when you do landscape your systems, it's always a good practice to use, you know, basic sanitation, uh, you know, wearing gloves, make sure you wash your hands, you know, things like that. 
And again, when you're planting, once you've decided to plant, you don't want to irrigate uh, the that drain field, the landscaping heavily. It's fine to water lightly to keep the plants, you know, to establish the plants and keep them healthy. Um, so, if, you know, you run into a dry period and you notice things are getting a little, little dry on your, your drain field, you can lightly irrigate, but you certainly don't want to add an inch of rain. I would just say very, you know, a light, just to kind of keep the plants, you know, healthy. And, and that's as far as you'd want to go. So those are some basic tips. Uh, I do want to mention a couple of other things. One is, is that uh, last year I worked with uh, Emily Ranson with Clean Water Fund in Maryland, and we um, set up, uh, had a grant from Chesapeake Bay Trust where we set up two septic gardens, we're calling them septic gardens, where we landscape two uh, septic systems within Howard County. We're, we have uh, a second phase of that grant. So we are going to be looking for two additional drain fields. It has to be in Howard County because Howard County is also funding that program. But I wanted to mention that. So if you're interested in possibly uh, working with us, uh, and we have the, the uh, University School of Architecture helping, uh, landscape architecture helping with the design. And then we are also helping to co cover a large portion of the plants and planting. So it's a good opportunity. Uh, we're learning from these systems. And uh, this is an opportunity for us to, you know, kind of explore, maybe even do some some field research here, if you will. So uh, again, there's a wealth of information on septic systems. I, there's a couple of fact sheets here specifically on landscaping. Uh, EPA has some guidelines. Uh, I'm working with uh, our previous native plant person on a longer list of uh, recommended plants. But uh, again, there's a lot of choices that you have uh, with landscaping plants. Um, Let's see. I think that's all I have. Um, Amanda, did you want to, uh, you want me to just yeah, I have a, a couple slides with resources. Um, and yes, great. I'll just, oh, I'll just correct. Click it. Yeah. So, um, just as a reminder, the native plant center can create your, um, curated lists for your clients. So if you, I'm happy to send you curated lists for um, your specific geographic area and your site conditions if you would like them. Um, but an easier, um, uh, faster way probably is just to put your conditions into this Native Plant Center. Mm -hmm. And um, they have uh, wet feet plants in there as well. So if you have standing water, they have plants for those as well. Um, and I think that Andy also has lists that are good for stormwater ponds um, yes. that he can share with you guys. Um, go ahead, next slide, Andy. Uh, just some favorite books. Um, if you want resources and um, the planting in a post wild world is, um, I believe the one that Claudia is talking about, uh, green mulch. Um, okay, next one. And if your clients are looking for Chesapeake Bay landscape professionals to do installation, um, design or maintenance of any of the small best management practices we talked about for habitat um, restoration, um, we can also curate lists for your geographic area for that. And then Think maybe there's one more. Yep, lots of links um, on here. So you'll get this slide with all the resources um, listed. And there are rebate incentive programs for some of these practices, um, depending on where you're located throughout the state. And then the last slide has our contact information. Um, and please uh, use the QRQC link to do our teaching effectiveness forms for us. <laughs> uh, so thank you. We'll take questions. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you both so much. Um, wonderful to have all this really super helpful information. Um, there's been a couple of communications coming into the Q&A and also into the chat. So just wanted to remind you at this point, if you have any questions for our presenters that you have not put into the Q&A at this point, please do so. Um, so there's one question that came up during Andy's presentation. So that one is about the 
repair areas that you mentioned. Um, so someone saying they're not understanding the repair areas, meaning that when the original drain field fails, you'll have to reroute to the repair area. I think they're kind of asking for clarification if that's yeah, why. Yeah, I kind of, uh, yeah. So, so what happens when a drain field fails, okay, can no longer accept wastewater. And, and it's, it's designed that from day one, as wastewater goes through, it's got a lot of nutrients, a lot of organic material, and it enters the soil and the bacteria are doing their thing uh, to help break that down. But over time, it creates a, what's called a biomat or organic layer, and it, and it eventually will clog that soil. So the drain field will fail, and you can't repair a drain field. You can't repair a drain, uh, clogged soil. You have to go to a new area on your property and dig a new drain field. And that's what the repair areas are. It's that drain field replacement area. I hope that helps. Awesome. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, the next question was from the chat. Okay, so someone was saying that they thought grasses were generally very deep rooted. So is it still okay to use them over the septic field? Yeah, so again, it depends upon your, your if you had a, a, a shallow conventional trench system that say it's only two feet deep. Um, typically, because the roots are very fine uh, and, and the grass will, again, die out during the, the winter, those roots tend to kind of dissolve. Um, but it's it's a it's shrubbery or tree roots that tend to be thicker and, and and again they tend to go deeper even than that say two feet deep. But again, if your trenches are three to four feet deep, grasses would would be fine. And we've seen lots of systems and like you know with with tip you know a variety of grasses over them, and we haven't noticed problems. Now again, we're not. I don't know of anybody around the country that's done the digging. You know to you know, explore to see what sort of impact is they're having on the system. But, um, you know, again, just based on time, uh, a lot of those grasses seem to work well. Awesome. Thank you. And someone had asked for a URL for the teaching evaluation. So I'm just grabbing that and putting that into the chat right now, just in case you'd rather use that instead of the um, QR code. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, no problem. All right, and it looks like um, folks are also asking if the presentation, meaning the slides, will be available for folks to refer to later. So are you both comfortable sharing slides? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome, okay. Um, and that's it for the questions. If you have any last minute ones, go ahead and get them in there now. Um, there was a point, I think a Juga reptans was on one of the plant lists and that one is generally invasive in this area. So for those folks that were pointing that out, that's correct. Thank you for saying that to us. Which okay. one was that? I'm sorry. A Juga reptans. Oh yeah, okay. That Yeah, that's questionable. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. All right, awesome. So without seeing any further questions, I'm gonna go ahead and say thank you to Amanda and Andy for this wonderful presentation.